So the uncommitted movement, you know, they call themselves a movement. They're obviously not part of the party apparatus. They've been dangling the fact that they're uncommitted as a way to get concessions from the party. Um, the ultimate the ultimate threat is obviously their vote. And you could see they didn't want to do any disruptions. They did they ignored my email of August 9th to help get involved with it. And even the Washington woman who was from, you know, if not now, who said the Palestinian people don't want to know about it. They want plausible deniability. Um, you know, there were people, delegates who either are elected officials in the party, they want to be elected officials in the party, they're consultants to the Democratic Party. And she was saying these people don't necessarily want that, but they do want to be taken seriously as, as um, advisors if they're asked. So if they do something like that, they're not going to be taken seriously. One of the women was even trying to get elected to the Board of Regents in her state, and she didn't join our protest. She wanted to. She's actually Palestinian. She's lost family. But she didn't do it because she thought it might, speaking out, would affect her election. Well, they sabotaged her anyway. She came in with the most support, and she did not get voted in. So I, you know, I had a long conversation with Layla Elabed, who's the other founder at the yeah, DNC. She's been on the show, yeah. Yeah, and um, she was saying, you know, it's a. She didn't use the term, but we use this term during Occupy: diversity of tactics. Like they wanted to play it nice with the right. Democratic Party, right. but we could do whatever we want outside. But you see, playing it nice didn't even get them a speaker. It was the one simple little thing that they demanded and they didn't get that speaker my feeling is that if they really really wanted to be a threat and they really wanted to try to get this they would say whether they do this or not in the end it doesn't even matter but they would say look we've got three anti-genocide candidates here and the people who are abandoned harris i'm going to have those people on my show from the different states because they're serious they were radicalized by this genocide, and there is no way they know that whoever they vote for has no chance of getting elected, but it's like a moral line in the sand for them. And that's what it is for me. And I tell people, like people that I argue with, who, who even agree that a genocide is going on, but they say, look, Trump is so much worse than all the other issues. I said, this is not an issue. I said, this is a moral line in the sand. I said, imagine you were alive in 1944, and um, you knew that uh, FDR not only knew about the Holocaust and did nothing, but he actually provided the ovens to the Nazis. Could you vote for him? And they haven't answered me, but that's what it is for me. I cannot vote for somebody who is aiding and abetting a genocide. I don't care how much better they are on the other issues. So, you know, I feel like if, if the uncommitted movement said, look, we're going to ask our people to vote for Jill Stein or Cornell West or vote their conscience or stay home or do whatever. I'm just kind of waiting and seeing if they're ultimately going to fall in line for her. I think that's going to be super interesting. What do you think, Nadia? I mean, for me, it felt like these were like, I'm a DNC, technically a DNC insider as a DNC member. Uh, but I'm also not like, I don't make a living off the party. Like I, like I'm, I'm like an academic. Um, uh, and, and so and the reason I even first got involved and ran for delegate is 2020 was I just want to know what the process was like as an academic, like how, how, like how did these people all of a sudden get all this control? And I realized it was pretty easy to become a delegate. Like I just had, uh, I came from a medium sized County in Florida. My dad, uh, you know, campaigned for me at the mosque. That was the extent of my, uh, election, but I, I, you know, I, I knew that like there's a formula. Like you can get people from rural counties, from red states, um, and, and medium-sized states that elected because they have diversity quotas. And so we in 2020, in 2016, there was 225 Muslim delegates. In 2020, there was 150, 175 Muslim delegates. In 20 24, there was maybe 60, 65 Muslim delegates. So it basically became a fraction of that. Um, and that was because, uh, like, uncommitted, when I first started, it, heard it coming on the scene, just by the people who were, were kind of behind it, 
um, and the people who were pushing it out within the community, they 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 were really like what in my experience from 2020, those were the opportunists, the people who had basically taken all the power of the Muslim community and just tried to get a couple of uh, a political appointments. Um, and, and that's what that's what they had done. We had basically taken all the power and given it to this uh, one organization. And so I'd you know been criticizing them fr from before. Um, and I wasn't like h hiding it in any way. Like I wrote article after article about it. Um, and you know, you, there's definitely like a diversity of tactics. Uh, but you know, there were only 30 delegates, and there was maybe 65, 60 Muslim delegates. And so I felt like they could actually learn, and like there's some overlap between the two. But I think that there was something that we could also offer them. But from what I saw right away, like when they joined our WhatsApp group, they joined it just to do data mining, to basically go to our delegates and then reach out to them and get them to be ceasefire delegates to slash do nothing. Um, and then w w when they did that, like Abbas was in the chat, Layla was in the chat, and they were saying, you know, you're really harming the Palestinian cause. But I was like, what exactly is your, your end goal? Because in the end, uh, both of you have like connections to, to um, you know, Abbas used to be the former chief of staff to Cori Bush, uh, and Layla is Rashida Tlaib's sister. And so they're really close like they're not going to go nuclear uh, in a way that really has to has to happen uh, because they're really just too close, like too much proximity to it. And they're also they're, they're good organizers in the sense that like, they're campaign driven, like let's raise money, let's, you know, get people registered and get their emails. But in terms of like doing the policy, being hard hitting, uh, neither of them are able to do that. In fact, when they first met with uh, Kamala, like they were crying. Like if you're gonna just if you're if you're advocacy just like wear kifaya and cry, that's not gonna get you where you want, especially where the DNC and the Harris campaign are gonna do everything they can to stop you. And so there is like a level of naivete in the, what they were doing. And what what a boss said to me, like when he joined my WhatsApp group for a second and then left it, he said, you know, uh, Salam, I disagree strongly with your assessment, Navi, and I hope you will support the organizing of Palestinian Arab-led organizing in our community. Many thanks to everyone here for your leadership. And then I said, that's not my assessment, that's fact. And then he just left the group, you know, he entered and then he left. And so that's just like, that's like gaslighting 101. And it's also telling me that he doesn't welcome Muslim organizing. And if you look at the uncommitted movements, essentially what you would call like secular chic, uh, where, where they promote people within their movement who are not like visibly Muslim or or it's primarily this is something that they actually told me, which I wasn't aware of, is that they've been they've been criticized for being too too uh, white uh, and too secular. And so this is why I think that it limited the uh, counts. And I think that we can definitely like move forward. But I think that we also need to see that you really have to draw a line in the sand with activism and advocacy. I did want to talk about my grandfather because um, this is an interesting thing that I think you and I share, Katie, being Jewish. Um, I don't know when you had your, you know, revelation that everything we had been told our whole lives was wrong. Maybe you knew it all along. But I grew up, you know, my grandfather was actually the first person approached by Henry Bernstein, who was the executive vice president of the United Jewish Appeal in 1947 to raise money for um, Jews, to bring Jews from the Holocaust to Palestine. It wasn't even Israel then. And my grandfather, who had donated $3,000 in 1946, donated $50,000 which was like one oh, quarter of his net worth, not his business profits, but his net worth, and probably the equivalent of 700,000 today. But he wrote in his autobiography that he wanted to become a millionaire so he could give more money to Israel. He and my father donated and raised millions more over the next five decades. But when I tell this story, I always say that they would be turning in their graves if they could see what the fascist government of Israel is doing to the Palestinian people, that these are not my Jewish values. And I always said I was motivated by tikkun olam, which means heal the world, and tzedakah, which is charity. I have since learned some more terms because I'm not religious. I'm very right. secular. But in my Jewish Voice for Peace group, I've learned more terms that Jews can use to defend our position on this. And they are doikot, doikite which are the Jewish labor bonds concept of fairness as right. opposed to theirness of Zionism. So struggling in solidarity with other oppressed groups in the places we find ourselves in diaspora. 
The other term is Cheshban Hanafesh, which is accounting of the soul, Lota Ahmad, don't be a bystander, and Darkai Shalom, the path to peace is peace for all. So I, you know, learned, I grew up with all this Israel stuff, and I even went to Israel in 1970, the summer of 1976. And um, it wasn't until like 40 years later, 2006, well, I guess that's 30 years later, when I joined LA Jews for Peace, that I learned everything I had been told was wrong, that it wasn't a land without people for a people without land, that all the Arab countries didn't want to drive them into the sea, that all, you know, it was always the Arabs that started all the wars and the altercations. And my eyes opened, and every time they had a march, when Israel would retaliate disproportionately, whether it was Operation, Doctrine. Or Operation Protective Edge, I'd always be on the side of the street with my fellow Jewish Voice for Peace people marching on the Palestinian side, not on the Jewish side with the stand with us, or, you know, stand with us, that really rabid Disgusting, Zionist yeah. group. And um, the only thing that I can say, you know, to end on a note of hope is that I feel like the young generation, it's going to take the young generation in this country to get to some political power and maybe in donation power because we still have the survivors alive, even though some survivors are on our side, and the children of survivors, which are sometimes even more rabid than their parents. Um, the young people really see this as an oppression tied with all the other oppressions. Right. And the connections made between African Americans and Palestinians right now is super strong. And we know it's not gonna happen in Israel because every generation there is more right wing than the last one. And it's become messianic. It's like an ultra orthodox conservative messianic movement. And you can't reason with those people. Right. But I think like the hope that I see is in these college protests. And I only hope that they are able to continue because they've had the whole summer to prepare for them. They're putting in all these rules against them. As you know, you know, people are losing their jobs. Professors are losing their jobs. Students are losing internship opportunities, job prospects. There's a tremendous amount of pressure. And um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with, with colleges starting up this month. Yeah, I think young people protested against the Vietnam War. And I, I think in this fall coming up, students are going to continue to protest. There was over 4,000 students that were arrested last spring. For every one protester that was arrested, there was probably 100 students behind them. So that's about you know, four or 500,000 students that are out there that it's not protesting mildly, like, you know, very, very strongly, very radically. And that's the change. That's where the change is going to come. You're not going to see any change coming from the DNC or within the Democratic Party. That change is going to come from the streets, from those students.